bunch of people whose barometers were literally given to them from their parents. And because of that, they don't know anything else other than what their parents have told them to do. They don't know anything else other than what their parents have told them to say. And this is the reason why we're doing today's session to help other people understand whether it's those of you who are joining us out there in the YouTube stratosphere or whether it's those of you who are with us here in the private room. I want you guys to understand that we have to check who set our bar. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to be reading verse 44 to get us started off. And I'm going to open up in a word of prayer as we jump into today's session. Heavenly Father, we just want to lift your name up high. We just want to declare that you are the one to receive all glory, all adoration and all honor in this and every setting, regardless of how long it takes. Father, we just want to appreciate you as we share your truth today, talking about who set our bar, who set your bar. Who is it that's setting the bar? We really want to discover who's setting the bar so we can identify. If need be, we can modify. And as a result of modifying, we'd be able to accelerate with the bar that we are supposed to have. We ask for your insight, your hindsight, your foresight in all of these things we're going to be discussing in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, guys, look, let's get started. We're in Matthew chapter 13. 44 and for those of you who are joining us on the live stream in youtube i just want to say a great big welcome to you this is our men's bible and breakfast session which we run on the first saturday of every single month we do that in a private setting which we have the private zoom going on right now and then we also live stream and broadcast that to the world on youtube we've been doing this for over five years and we used to do this on the facebook platform but we decided to skirt 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 into my favorite platform which is YouTube. So guys, if you get any value throughout today's session, feel free to just feel free to isolate your value into the comments and let everyone else share that value as well. So today we're going to be talking about who set your bar. And for today's session, I want to start with this question. It's an interesting question. And that question is, what is one of the most valuable things you have and why? So if you're in the private room, feel free to let me know in the chat, what's one of the most valuable things that you have and why is it valuable to you? Again, you don't have to give an essay. You can you can keep that in a short, succinct fashion. Or if you want to go into essay mode, you can do that as well because it's all going to be helpful. But I want us to really touch base on this. Like, what's a valuable thing in your life? And here's the interesting thing. There's no wrong answer. I love that. Brother Benjamin says, my relationships. Keep them coming, guys. Okay? And Brother Benjamin, let us know why. I see it. Brother Israel also says relationships. I love it. All right? Let us know. What are one of the most valuable things in your life and why? Because the interesting thing about what we're going to be talking about today is we are going to be uncovering, unpacking exactly how our value has been ascribed to many things. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. I love that development, Brother Israel says as well. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 is where we're getting started. All right. And this is going to help us open it up in order to really see exactly where I'm coming from. And here's, the, here's, here's something funny, all right? I'm going to share with you guys a story. Thank you, Brother Tyrone. He says, the right mind. Thank you, Brother Dabble, who says growth. I'm going to share with you guys a quick story. So, interestingly enough, a number of years ago, when I was around 16, 17 years old, um, there was a particular girl that I was dating. And um, I invited that girl actually to my house, my mom's house at the time. And a few weeks later, okay, a few weeks later, I was talking to one of her friends, okay? And this was like a mutual acquaintance that we both had. And this mutual acquaintance said to me, she said, when that girl came to your house, she came back with the report that the only thing she saw in your, in your room, in your, in your wardrobe was name brand clothes. She said there were literally no non-name brand clothes in your wardrobe. Now, those of you who know a bit more about my story, you guys know that from the age of 11, kind of really the age of 13 where it really took off, you know, I was steeped in the wrong things in life. I was doing crime, et cetera, et cetera. And the interesting thing is when that story, when that report came back to me from our mutual friend, I was really shocked. I was surprised. The reason why is because in my mind, I didn't see that I had this habit. I didn't see that I had this desire. I didn't see that I had a bar for the clothes I wore. You see, today I'm wearing a plain white tee. <laughs> Nobody knows where the white tee's from. You know what? Because today, that's me. Today, I have a bar very different around branding and clothing that I wear 
than the bar that I had as a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old. And the reason I want to start by sharing this story with those of you who are here in the private room, those of you who are connecting on other fashions, is because I want you to understand, especially those of you who are watching on the replay, I want you to understand that our bars change. Throughout life, our bars literally change. Our barometers change. Our barometers for life, the standards we have for our life literally changes throughout our lives. So that story of when I was 16, 17 years old and I heard someone come into my space and leave my space and the report they had was, oh wow, every single garment in this house, every single garment in this room was name brand. You see, that stood out to someone because maybe the bar they had set, but it didn't, it wasn't something I had noticed because the bar I had set. If this is helping someone, let me know. So let's go into Matthew 13, 44, and you guys are going to start to see from the pages of scripture exactly how sometimes we set our bar the wrong way, like I did as a youth. And because we set our bar the wrong way, what happens is people observe those bars and based on how their bar is set, they make their report. Okay. And this is very important because your whole life is literally being measured and judged by the bar you set. And many people think it's being measured and judged by the bar someone else sets. It's literally being measured and judged by the bar you set. So let's go in. Matthew 13 verse 44, it reads, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. That's a standard, ladies and gents. That's a standard, my brothers. That's a standard, kings. You see, you have to understand that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. It has its own standard. Now, here's the interesting thing about any treasure. Some people recognize it and some people don't. Why is this of value? Hear this. Some of you said relationships are of value to you. Some of you said here the right mind is of value to you. Some of you said here growth is of value to you. Well, here's the interesting thing about all those things you shared. Some people value them and some people don't. Some people recognize, hold on, my relationships are of importance to me. They're of value to me. They're like treasure to me. Some people don't. And this is why it's so important to understand from Matthew 13, 44, that there are treasures out there that some people don't recognize. Let's go further. Matthew 13, 44, read it on. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth it. Because it's of value to him when he finds it, when he discovers it, when he realizes and rationalizes, hold on a minute, this is of value, he keeps it safe for what's about to happen. Let's see what's about to happen. He hide of it and for joy thereof, okay? Not for sorrow, for joy, because that's what treasure brings. It brings a joy. Goeth and selleth all that he hath and buys the field buy of that field look here's something that hopefully you guys start to understand and see is interesting for yourself and your life as well you see the bible is telling us in matthew 13 44 that the kingdom of heaven is valuable and it's so valuable it's like something so valuable that when you discover it you want to make sure you can get it and because you want to make sure you can get it so much you know what you're going to do you're going to be willing to do you're going to be willing to change your bar you're going to be willing to change your barometer. You're going to be willing to say, you know what? These were all the things I thought were valuable before, but now I understand that these are not as valuable as this. I'm getting rid of all this to get this. This is exactly what it says here. It says, you know what he does? He hides it and goes and gets rid, goes and sells everything he thought was valuable before. So a great question, to follow on from the question we started with of what do you believe is of value and why is to start to investigate why you think those things are of value because the moment you start to investigate why you think those things are of value is the moment you start to see okay i now see how a bar was set for me you see, when I was 17, 18, and for me, it was so important to have name brand clothes, even though I never, I guess, consciously realized it was an important thing for me. I never realized that. Like, I can be honest with you guys. I don't remember being 17 and thinking to myself, I only wanted to wear name brand. I don't remember that. I don't ever remember 
feeling like, oh, I'm, I have to have name brand. I don't ever remember feeling that. And the reason I'm sharing this, I don't want you guys to think I'm going off on a tangent. I want you to see the application, how this applies to everybody's life. The reason I'm sharing this is because I want you to know sometimes the bar we have set for us has been so well set for us, we don't even know there's a bar there. Mm. You see, this guy tells you this right here, Matthew 13, 44. The parable tells you this. It says, when he discovers the treasure, which is like the kingdom of heaven, he goes and sells everything that he had what does that tell you that tells us that he didn't realize that there was something out there worth discovering more important than what he had already discovered because the moment he discovers the new thing the moment he discovers the new treasure the moment he discovers the kingdom of heaven he sells the rest he was able to identify that this treasure here is worth every single thing i have invested and spent and wasted my life on and more so i'll sell that stuff i'll get rid of that stuff i will place that stuff in the marketplace in order to receive something i can use to obtain that kingdom that real treasure so i want you guys to understand that some of us are in a position right now whether we're tuning in on the replay whether we're here live some of us are in a position right now where we have bars we have standards that have been set for us we're not even aware of we have standards on reading. You got to ask yourself, how often do I read and why? Some of us have standards on praying. How often do I pray and why? Here's the interesting one, because I spend a lot of the time in my work dealing with people with this one. We have a lot of bars and standards around wealth and why? There are people who say to themselves, and this is one of the things I really appreciate um, having engagement with Dr. Myron Golden about, because this was one of the things that I learned from him. He said, you know what? When you ask a person, how healthy do they want to be? They say, I want to be as healthy as possible. When you ask a person, how smart do you want your children to be? They say, I want my children to be as smart as possible. But when you ask people how much money they want to have, they say, oh, I just want enough to get by. You see, that doesn't make sense. How can that make sense? How can you want an abundance of health? How can you want an abundance of in information, an abundance of education, but you don't want an abundance of another thing that potentially could be good for you? That doesn't make sense. But let me tell you why it doesn't make sense. And let me tell you why many people live at that bus stop, simply because they have a barometer, they have a bar that has been set for them, which doesn't work. And here's the thing, I said it already, I'll say it again. For many of us, that bar is subconscious we're not even aware of it just like the 17 year old samuel who's saying to himself it doesn't mean it doesn't make a difference to me whether it's name brand or not but in the wardrobe there's only name brand it's exactly the same you're living under a standard you're living under a barometer you weren't even aware was there let's go deeper you see what i want to share with you guys is an acronym for the word bar for us to be able to use these three things and adjust our bars in our life and recognize what the wrong ones are and shift them when we need to shift them. And the thing I want you to start by understanding is what we believe presently can keep us from what we desire to receive. What we believe presently can keep us from what we desire to receive. What do I mean? This man in the parable of Matthew 13, 44, if he believed that all the things he had worked for were more important than the actual treasure, he would have walked past the treasure without valuing it. So what we believe sets the bar for what we're able to receive. It's because he was able to believe this is treasure. That he was able to go and get rid of the stuff he used to believe was of value in order to receive the thing that is truly of value. Hope you guys understand this because this is the same battle that's going on in your life and in my life today. It's the exact same battle. The battle of what you believe. What you believe is literally determined what you can receive. So let's go deeper. We're going to go to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read a few verses. Acts 16, I'm starting in verse 27. And we're going to be talking about belief because the first letter 
in bar is B, and that for us is going to stand for belief. Acts chapter 16. And this is an interesting portion of scripture. You've got the men of God, they've been apprehended, placed in prison. And as they're placed in prison, everybody thinks they're locked in and locked on. Everybody thinks they can't get out. Let's see exactly what happens in Acts 16 verse 27 to verse 32. Let's go. It says, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open. Okay, so for those of you who want more context, you've got the men of God who are out there changing lives. And from them changing lives, they decide to change the life of a possessed person, a particular person. And the moment they do that, they perform that miracle. The owners, the people that were in charge of that person, started to attack the men of God and get them placed in prison. Now, whilst they're placed in prison, the men of God begin to praise God. They start singing, praising, worshipping God. And as they start singing, praising, praising and worshipping God, verse 26 tells us, I'll, I'll read it, 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. So this is a prison full of people handcuffed shackled the prison doors closed god has one intervention earthquake comes through everybody is now literally free they they could walk out okay so the man in charge of the prison his job was to make sure they can't walk out now they couldn't walk out verse 27 and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword. Listen to this. He didn't draw out his sword and attempt to, to slay or control all the prisoners. Look at what he did. He drew out his sword and would have killed himself. You see, when we believe erroneous things, here's the funniest thing. Sometimes we're literally killing ourselves. Sometimes we're literally attempting to kill ourselves. Let's go deeper so you guys understand. And would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled the guy was about to kill himself commit suicide why because he believed something he supposed something he assumed something question you gotta ask yourself is what are the assumptions what are the beliefs what are the what are the um assumptions some summative thoughts what are the things i'm believing that may not actually be right this is what's happening with this guy he believed something he assumed something it says he would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So because he believed, hold on a minute, all the doors are open. These prisoners must have run away. He was going to kill himself. Here's the funniest thing. Do you see that he believed what he believed probably based on what he would have done if he was in their predicament? Mm. You see, but here's the funniest thing. He's not in their predicament. <sighs> Somebody caught that. Here's, you see, the funniest thing is many human beings assume they know what they would do if they were in someone else's predicament. But here's the funniest thing. You're not in their predicament. So do you know what that means? That actually means you don't know what they would do. You have no clue what they would do. You can't have an idea what they would do because you're not in their predicament. How do I know that? I'll give you an example. I remember... When I first decided to start to follow the faith, I was 18, 19 years old and I was a part of a particular church. And at the time I was tithing to that church. I was taking 10% of my revenue and giving it to that church. And here's the funniest thing. At the time I didn't have a job. I didn't have an income at 18, 19 years old. I didn't have a potential, a, a particular income at that time. So whatever I would receive, I would give. And I remember having particular family members literally laughing at me. Saying, what are you doing? You're paying time. You're paying 10% of everything you go, you get to that church. You know, charity begins at home. All of these things I was told. But here's the funniest thing. A line was dropped, which helped me know I was doing the right thing. Okay. And I'm not, when I say doing the right thing, I'm not, they say no, tithe or don't tithe thing. I'm saying doing the right thing in terms of making a decision for myself. The line that was dropped was when you make 10,000, when you make a hundred, no, when you make a hundred thousand, that's the time to give 10,000. And I remember saying in that conversation, I said, look, if I make 100,000, 
I won't give 10,000. And the reason I won't give 10,000 is I won't know how to. I won't have the bone in my body, the thought in my mind that I can give that much. Because if you can't give a pound with 10 pounds from 10 pounds, how can you give a thousand from 10,000? How can you give 10,000 from 100,000? How can you give 100,000 from a million? Now, the reason I share this with you is because I want you to understand. You see, it's easy to say what you would do if. If you had a million, of course you'd give 100,000. Of course you would. But when you're in the seat of the person who has a million, come and tell me that that's what you would do. Because most people say what they would do if, but they don't actually do it now that they can. And this is why it's powerful to understand the Bible doesn't teach when you can. The Bible says whenever it's in the power of your hand to do good, do it. Do it now. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. You see, the interesting thing is the Bible doesn't teach do this tomorrow, do this next week, do this next year. The Bible teaches tomorrow's not promised. Make it happen now. This is why you have to be good at making decisions if you really want to follow the Lord. Because it's funny, as I'm sharing this, it's reminding me of a particular passage of scripture where Jesus shares with the disciples about what we call today the communion. He says, listen, you got to eat my body. You got to drink my blood. And the Bible says in that place, it says so powerfully, it says, and these words were too hard for many to receive. And at that time, many left off from following him. You know why? Because you have to be good at making decisions now if you truly want to follow God. Because God, God, God does not live in the realm of time. God lives in the realm of infinity, in the realm of infinite time. So God, God is not thinking, oh, tomorrow you should, tomorrow you could. God is seeing you as the were one. Someone's saying, oh, that's hard to believe. Okay, well, why did he say to Jeremiah? He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. I had already ordained you. Here's the funniest thing. I want everyone to understand. God's not looking at you right now, how you look at you right now. This is why we have to get our beliefs in order. This is why we have to get our beliefs in check. Because if our beliefs aren't in check, we won't believe about ourselves, what God believes about us, what God knows about us. And we won't operate on that level, which brings us to the other two letters of the bar. But let's stay in here deeper. Acts 17. <clears throat> Apologies, Acts 16. Let's go deeper. So I'm going to keep going as we talk about this jailer. 27. And the keeper of the prison awoke out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do yourself no harm. Don't hurt yourself. Don't kill yourself. For we are all, for we are all here. He's telling him, your assumption was wrong. What you supposed was wrong. What you believed was wrong. You don't have to, you don't, here's the funniest thing. You wouldn't have to do what you're trying to do if only you knew that what you believed was wrong. I'll give an example. I studied four degrees and today I don't use any of them. I'm going to say that again. I studied four degrees and today I don't use any of them. I'm going to say it again. You wouldn't have to do the thing you think you need to do if only you knew that what you believed was wrong. Let's keep going. Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He said, listen, he said, I understand that you guys had the chance to do what I would have done. I understand that with all these doors open, with all these shackles broken, I understand that you could have left, but you chose not to. What kind of people are you? What must I do to be like you? You see, here's the interesting thing. I want you guys to understand this. When you understand sometimes that your beliefs are wrong and you recognize that your beliefs are wrong and someone helps you realize your beliefs are wrong, start to learn how to shift those beliefs. This is exactly what this jailer did. This jailer didn't stick in his way. Oh, I don't believe him. He's a prisoner. I'm now going to still kill myself. He didn't say that. 
He said, listen, he said, he said, you guys could have done something else, but you didn't. You didn't do the thing I would have done. What do I need to do to be like you? Let's go further. 29. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Tw um, sorry, 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out, verse 30, and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved and thy house. Let's go further. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house, 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes because they had been beaten before they were thrown in prison and was baptized he and all his straightway. You see, this here is a formula for change in your life. What are you believing? You see, the apostle Paul and Silas, you know what they said to the jailer? They didn't say to the jailer, listen, you need to start going out there and doing miracles and getting beat up and thrown in prison. You don't have to look like us. You don't have to do necessarily what we did, but you have to start on the same foundation. And that foundation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will receive what you desired. You will be saved. Your bar is always going to first be set by your beliefs, ladies and gents. You see, brothers, I want you guys to understand that our beliefs are what set the foundation of the standards we have in our life. So this guy had a standard, he was going to kill himself. He was going to hang himself. He was going to stab himself. He was going to use that sword so he was no longer here. And the interesting thing is he heard new information. And we don't always get that new information. Or sometimes we don't always interpret that new information. Like I shared in Matthew 13, 44, sometimes the treasure is right in front of us, but we don't recognize its treasure. And it says that because he heard Paul shout with a loud voice, Mr. Jailer, we're here. We haven't gone anywhere. He got a light. I want you guys to understand what a light is symbolic of. The Bible says your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You see, the light is the truth. He got truth. He was illuminated and came in the room and saw they hadn't gone anywhere. And the moment he saw that, he said to them, look, if you guys could make a decision like staying, even though the doors were open, I need to be like you. What do I need to do to be saved? And they gave him the formula. The simple formula to start it all is believe on the right thing. Not believe in the right thing, believe on the right thing. Your beliefs must be founded on the right thing for you to have the right bar. Today, as we go in, I want you guys to understand that as our foundation, we must believe on the right thing. It's our beliefs that set our bars. It's our belief that basically put us where we need to be. Now, Here's something interesting that many people don't realize. His belief was what was motivating his action. I'm going to say that again. So it's real clear. His belief, the jailer's belief, was what was motivating his action. Let me go further. Paul and Silas's belief was what was motivating their action. It was the jailer's belief that they had gone and left the prison that was motivating him to act in the sense of committing suicide. It was Paul and Silas's belief that they are trusting on the name of the Lord that allowed them to sing praises and worship inside of prison. Your beliefs are motivating your actions. What we believe on initiates our bar. What are we believing on? We have to start asking ourselves that question. What am I believing on? And here's the funniest thing. Our actions are going to determine the A for the bar. The A is what we achieve. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. Old Testament book, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Our actions from what we believe are going to determine what we achieve. 1 Samuel chapter 30. And here's the thing. Some people don't know what they believe. That's okay. Just check out what you've achieved. Okay? A lot of people haven't realized they can do that. You can work backwards. God does. The Bible says that he's the one who knows the end from the beginning. You can work backwards, okay? So if you don't know what you believe, start to look at what you've achieved. Now, when I say what you've achieved, I'm not talking about what you're happy you've achieved. Oh, I've got four degrees. I've got my driver's license. No, 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 no. What have you really achieved? Okay? What have you really achieved? Are you achieving the things you desire to achieve in your life? 
Or are you still very far from them? And have you always been very far from them? Because what you believe is actually the foundation of the actions you've taken, but thus what you've achieved. And if you don't know what you believe, start to assess what you've achieved. That will help you understand what you believe. And don't lie to yourself, because I can tell you something. What you've achieved is not going to lie to you. First Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to read verse 8. So again, for more context, I'd encourage you guys to read the whole chapter. But just for you guys to have the context. In First Samuel chapter 30, we've got David who's going through turmoil. He's living out of the land. And as he's living out of the land, he and his soldiers have gone to war. As they've gone to war, people have raided their homeland. They've raided their tent or their, their current staying place. And as they've raided their tents, they've kidnapped all the people there. So David comes back with the soldiers and he sees everything's raided. Everything's gone. He's wondering to himself, why is everything so disarray? Let me ask you this. Have you seen that you've achieved disarray? I'll give you an example. Some of us go out to work. We go out to war in the marketplace and we come home and the house is a mess. This is what was, in a simple terms, this is what was happening to David. David was a soldier. He was, he was anointed to be king. So he was going out to do what kings do. He was going out to war, going out into his marketplace. But when he was coming home, everything was ravished. Everyone was kidnapped. Everything was going wrong in his home. This is why I said, if you want to understand what you believe, check out what you've achieved. Let's see what happens to David. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this group? After this troop, excuse me. So they've had a whole bunch of people literally ravish their, their place and go with the spoils. Go and kidnap the people. And David comes back and he doesn't say, oh, I just came back from war. Let's go back to war. He says, God, what should I do? He says, God, should I pursue them? God, should I go after them? He committed it unto God. Let's go deeper and see exactly what happened. Verse 8, shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and without fail recover everything, recover all. Let's read verse 9. I'll read 9 and 10. So David went. He and 600 men that were with him and came to the brook Bessor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bessor. 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water. 12. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of two clusters of raisins and when he had eaten his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drank any water three days and three nights 13 and david said unto him to whom do you belong to to whom belongest thou and whence art thou where have you come from and he said i am a young man of egypt servant to an amalekite and my more sick we made an invasion upon the south of the Sheretites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, canst thou bring me down to this company? Show me where the people are. Take me down to the people, to the group, to the troop of people who did this. And he said, swear unto me by God that thou will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and I will bring you down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, there was spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. I'll encourage you guys to read this chapter, read the chapter and the next chapter is the last two chapters of the book of of First Samuel in your own time. But hopefully you can see the narrative of what happens here. You see, a lot of the time in life, we're looking for the major thing. We're looking for the big payoff. Look at what happens with David. David comes back, realizes the thing that was really of value to him has been messed up. His home, his land. He goes to God because that's what he believed on. Just like we saw in Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord. He goes to God and says, God, what should I do? Should I pursue? Should I chase these people? Should I fight these people? The Lord says to him, pursue, go for it, take over them and you will recover everything. You'll get everything back. 
Here's the funniest thing. He looks at his soldiers. He had 600 and 200 were not strong enough. 200 were not in a position to actually go and fight. So 200 stay and 400 go. And as the 400 go, here's the funniest thing. As the 400 go, they find someone who is in a, who's in a place, who's in a state, who's mashed up, messed up. And when they find this Egyptian, they give him some food, give him some drink. And then he starts to tell them. They ask him, who are you? Where are you from? He says, listen, he's a slave. He's an Egyptian slave. And he's with the Amalekites. But his master, one of the Amalekites, realized this guy sick three days ago and left him for dead. You know why? Because of what the Amalekites believed. They left the man for dead. But what they didn't realize is what they believed, what that master believed, leaving his slave for dead, was allowing David to achieve, was allowing David to receive someone a clue. A clue to how he was going to pursue. A clue to how he was going to overtake. So the Egyptian tells him, listen, this is what happened. Over the last couple of days, this is what we did. We went through this land, took spoils. We went through that land, took spoils. We tore down Ziklag. So David says to him, listen, I want you to tell me where the people are, where your master is. He says, look, I'll tell you as long as two things. As long as one, you don't kill me. And two, you don't give me back to my master. He says, fine. They go down to the place and see the people praising, happy, winning. <laughs> Guys, I want you to understand how life works because this is the exact same thing that happened to the jailer. This is the exact same thing that happens to you. This is the exact same thing that happens to I. When we found our beliefs on the right thing, sometimes even when we found our beliefs on the wrong thing, we get a clue. The jailer founded his belief on the wrong thing. He supposed the wrong thing, but he got a clue. Paul said, look, we're still here. He could have ignored Paul and killed himself and still pulled the trigger. But he didn't. He inquired with the light. You see, the same thing's happening here. David decided to place his belief. He got the B right on the bar. He placed his belief on the Lord. And because he placed his belief on the Lord, he was told what to do. He started to pursue and he got a clue. I want you guys to understand that's what's going to happen for you. That's what happens for me. That's how this world is set up. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, seek and you will find. It doesn't say you'll find exactly the way you think you will be seeking. But it says seek and you'll find. It says knock and the door will be open. Ask and you shall receive. I want you guys to understand that we are able to achieve the moment, the right thing, the moment we believe the right thing. What we see here in 1 Samuel 30 verse 8 is something very simple. We see that when we have our beliefs on the right things, we will have the instructions to achieve the right things things let's go further so we can wrap up for today's session even we don't even have the time so this is what i'm going to do i'm going to share one more verse with you guys and we're going to wrap up there um actually let's let's do it let's do it matthew chapter 10 i'm going to read verse 1 to 8 matthew chapter 10 verse 1 to 8 i'll give you that additional verse as a bit of homework um for you guys hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 which will help you with the belief aspect of what we're talking about. Hebrews 11 verse 6 is for your notes. And Matthew 10 verse 1 to 8 is where we're going to go now um, and wrap up there. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 to 8. Guys, if you're getting value, let me see in the chat just the word value. If you're getting value from what we're sharing today, we're going to Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to be reading verses 1 to verse 8. And guys, I want you to understand that like, this is literally the framework on which we can live our life. How do I know that? Because in Genesis, we read and see God gave us the be, do, have model to set our whole life on. And the be, do, have model literally follows after what I'm sharing with you guys right here. The be, do, have model states you've got to be before you can do in order for you to have. And this is exactly what we're seeing here. How do you become? You become based on your beliefs. How do you start to do? Well, what you do is your actions, which are fostered from your beliefs, which allow you to achieve. And that's what determines what you have. Or, in other words, as we're talking about now, what determines what you receive. Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 1. And by God's grace, I'll get to verse 8 real quickly um, for us to wrap up. Matthew 10 verse 1. This is Jesus appointing the 12 disciples. It said, verse 1, And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. It would be interesting if he called these 12 and they didn't believe. <laughs> that would be so interesting, crazy. I see the comment, value, value, value in the chat. Let's keep going. Now, verse 2. The names of the 12 apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, 
and Andrew, his brother, James of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Let's go deeper. Five. These twelve Jesus sent forth. So hopefully you're seeing the thread. You gotta believe in order to achieve. We see in the book of Acts what we read is the jailer, even though he believed the wrong thing, he was able to get a clue so he could do the right thing and start to believe the right thing. And he asked, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? What must I do to be saved? Because when your beliefs start to get aligned, you start looking at your actions. And that's what we saw with David. David had the right beliefs in 1 Samuel chapter 30. So because he had the right beliefs founded on God, he went to God about what he should do. The moment he went to God about what he should do, God said, you should pursue. So the interesting thing is if our beliefs are founded on the right thing, we start to inquire to God about what we should do so we can do the right thing. Check this out. This is where it gets powerful for me in terms of what I'm sharing. These 12 he sent forth. He told them what to do. He sent them forth. And commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, he did not say preach salvation. He said, go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the same kingdom we read about in Matthew 13, 44, which is of value, which is a treasure. Okay, it always used to perplex me when I was around 18, 19 and I was getting serious with the Lord and I'd meet so many people my age and say to them, like, aren't you reading your Bible? Aren't you trying to pursue a relationship with God? And they tell me, no, I don't want to go to church because they're all hypocrites. I understand now why they had that mindset. The reason they had that mindset is because they saw no value. They saw no treasure in the place that people purport to be the house of God. This is why you got to understand what this thing actually says. Because when you start to understand what this thing actually says, you start to understand that what people call the house of God is not what God in the scriptures is calling his own house. That's going to take me somewhere else. Let me stop that. Mm. Verse 6, Matthew 10, verse 6, he said, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7, and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, something of value is coming something of value is here something of value needs to be responded to reacted to and related to verse 8 listen he says heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead he's telling them to do something watch this cast out devils freely ye received freely give you see this is the interesting thing for me because i remember reading this and saying to myself hold on a minute lord hold on a minute hold on a minute you're taking these disciples, these guys, from all these different backgrounds, as it shows you in Matthew 10, verse 1 to 8, and you're telling all of them they've got the power to do this, to do this, to heal the sick, to cleanse lepers. But he finishes with a powerful verse. He says, and as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then he says at the end, freely ye have received, freely give. I want you guys to understand we can only give how we receive. And this is why it's so important to understand the bar we've set for our life, the beliefs we've set for our lives, the achievements, the achi how we believe, how we achieve, and how we receive. The reason it's so important to analyze this, to, to exercise this, to get better at this, is because you can only give the way you receive. Why is this so important? Well, let me tell you. If you believe... <coughs> That your life, you've received bad luck. <laughs> Hashtag some people's story. If you believe you've received bad luck, you know how you're going to give. You're going to give out of your life as though everybody's got bad luck. You can only give based on how you receive. And let me tell you something. It's not based on how you really receive. It's based on how you perceive you've received. This is why the jailer was going to kill himself because he perceived that he had received something he didn't want to receive. And that's because, you, you see, most people don't understand this bar that we get to set in our life is a cycle. What you believe determines what you achieve, which determines what you receive and what you receive 
goes back and determines what you believe. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. And this is why so many people are stuck in their life because their cycle is on a downward trend. They've believed the wrong thing, so they've achieved the wrong thing, so they've received the wrong thing, which reinforces the belief of the wrong thing. I'll give an example about myself. I remember when I got my first degree and one of my lecturers said to me, you know what? I think you should go further. I wanted to do my master's. I, I got accepted um, at UCL to do my master's in statistics. And I remember my lecturer saying to me, you know what? I think you can do it. And I was, I was like, can I do it? You know, at the time UCL was the seventh best university um, according to the, you know, the times list and all of those things. It was the seventh best university in the world. And I was saying to myself, can I, can I do that? Can I go from this university, which wasn't a great university on paper anyway, to one of the best universities in the world and study a master's? You see, and I went to study that master's. And after one year of studying that master's in statistics, I failed my exams the first year. I failed my exams. And I finished after failing my exams and said to myself, like, how am I going to do this? How am I actually going to do this? And you know the interesting thing? It was at that point that I got my clue. I got a clue. And the clue that spoke out to me was, Samuel, why are you even doing this for? What are you doing this for? Forget whether you fail, forget whether you succeed. Obviously, I went back and did the exams again, but it, forget whether you fail, forget whether you, 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 you succeed. The real question is, what do you believe? Why are you actually doing this? And it was that process I went through of questioning why I was actually doing that master's in statistics that led me to go into voluntary work and starting to work for three years with underprivileged children in East London, literally teaching for free. And that helped me shift my mind and helped me realize, Samuel, we should stop doing things, trying to receive things and achieve things based on things we don't truly believe. And the only way you can do that is when you start to assess your beliefs. So I want to leave you guys today as we finish the session with a question. And that is how are you going to achieve? It's going to determine what you achieve. And what you achieve is going to determine what you receive. And you can only give based on how you receive. So I want you guys to understand that what you received so far in life is telling you what to believe so far in life. And if you want to change what you receive at the end of the bar, you need to change what you believe at the beginning of the bar. With that being said, we're going to wrap up on YouTube. We're going to open up the private room for people to share. So for those of you who are joining us on the live stream, God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our session. And feel free to let us know in the chat what was the biggest or the best thing that stu stood out to you and that you have taken away from today's session. God bless you guys.